Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Tough Talking Thursday. My name is Dennis Ja, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In studio tonight to talk tough, I have our chief political analyst, Mr. Wilmot Cooney. Mr. Cooney, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you, Dennis. I better be here again. I also have our democracy analyst, Mr. Josiah F. Jokai, ready to talk tough. Joe, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. This is Tough Talking Thursday. My name is Dennis Jai in studio tonight. Uh, for the issues we're going to be discussing, they're going to be very tough. But let me just give a few minutes to my uh, guests to just give some opening statement on this Tough Talking Thursday. Let's start with Mr. Jokai. <laughs> Well, I think it's always an opportunity to be here, and um, I like the conversation approach here at Focus on Liberia. That's why I'm always on, and I'm glad to be uh, one of your analysts, um, you know, to look at issues uh, that are affecting our country and those issues that are also uh, positive. Uh, so it's really good to be here this Thursday again to look at a number of national issues of concern. Thank you. Mr. Cooney. Well, it's always a, pl a pleasure for us to be here. Uh, of course, Focus on Liberia is the platform where we discuss, uh, we educate, and then we elevate everything Liberia. So uh, it is our hope that our viewers will find our exchanges uh, not only educational, but will find it also as uh, an information sharing platform that will help us in uh, discussing the issues that face our country. I am very happy to be back here again uh, this Thursday. Thank you. And we want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. This is Tough Talking Thursday. And let's get it started. Some of the issues we're going to be talking about, they are all national issues, issues of national concern. And we're going to be focusing on the challenges and the opportunities being presented by those issues. And we're going to have uh, you, our listeners, to viewers, to uh, to join the conversation. First, we're going to talk about the 20, Liberia's 2020 Human Rights Report. A report came out from uh, the U.S. State Department on Liberia. You know, this is not new. They always gave these uh, human rights reports, and we're going to look at that report, look at uh, it briefly what the implications are. We see the challenges being presented by the report and also the opportunities, but we're going to be talking tough on that. Still, rape cases. We have uh, girls being raped, mainly uh, girls. Sometimes teenagers, as uh, young as those in diapers, and the numbers seem to be on the upward climb. We're going to talk tough on this one because we are tired of hearing about these rape cases. Also, there is a new movement, I want to say that way, in Liberia called the Lapa Revolution. This, uh, this started with, uh, or it uh, came to the forefront with some ladies who were in the elections, they just ended by elections in Liberia. Things did not go as planned, and so they took their issues to the Supreme Court. Some succeeded, some didn't. And so the Lapa Revolution came out of that. We're going to talk about that. Also, Ritualistic killing, bojo issue, how men. It's not something new in Liberia. It's been there. And uh, the recent one took place in Harper, Maryland County. And uh, we're going to, I think, Harper or Plebo. And we're going to talk about that too. What happened, this whole uh, ritualistic killing issues. And also, there was some a burning of buildings in that place. Last but not the least, uh, there is a uh, mayoral race election that is going to take place in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. A fellow librarian by the name of Winfred Russell is in that race. He's a, a councilman on the Brooklyn Park City Council. We have another like, uh, American who is also by the name of uh, Hollis Winston who is taking place. And you have Liberians supporting both sides divided and is getting heated. We're going to also talk tough on that. Gentlemen, let's start with the uh, human rights report. I'm sure you guys read the report. 
or at least good bit of it. My first question is, should we real, should this report be something that we should concern ourselves of? Mr. Kuni. Well, uh, Dennis, uh, I think anytime there is an assessment of our country, either by us or by our international partners, I think we need to pay attention to that assessment. Uh, because these kind of assessment measure uh, our decision making, they measure the functioning of our institutions, and they measure, they measure the general issue of, of security and governance in our country. So I think anytime such an assessment is made, I mean, any well-meaning librarian need to pay attention to that. But having said that, we also have to recognize that uh, these reports, just like we noted during the Representative Smith uh, discussion, these are all routine functions of the United States government. These are all uh, regular activities of the US government. Uh, and as much as the issue that these report raises, that these that this report raise are important, my only disappointment is the level at which Liberia celebrates these things as if to say uh, this is the, 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 the silver line or this is, the, 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 this is what it takes to free our country of the ills that are in the society. Again, as I said on previous show, it is only the responsibility of Liberians to untangle themselves in the entanglement that we are in. And sometimes the premature celebration of these things, not by ordinary citizens, that one don't bother me, but by people, actual political leaders who believe that this report is the silver bullet that we need to solve our problem is what is... Uh, what is sometimes uh, embarrassing, at the least, to say. But whatever the report contains, there are issues that we should pay attention to, and there are issues that we should, we should address, that we should find a way to resolve in our country. Mr. Joker, uh, what's your take? You know, this, should this report something that we need to pay attention to? Absolutely. The report is very important going forward. Uh, for our democracy and our governance uh, system. Uh, firstly, I'd like to put this into a perspective for everyone to understand uh, the basis of such report, the rationale for such report. Uh, our people need to understand so that they don't just see it as an ordinary routine activity of the United States government through a state department. Uh, in the United States State Department, you have the Bureau of uh, Democracy and Human Rights. And that bureau is responsible to prepare and publish reports on annual basis. The list is very long. Uh, the reports that it publishes, some of them include the country reports on terrorism. Uh, and that focuses on countries that are under the spotlight on terroristic activities uh, for the most part. Sometimes they measure some uh, sub-Saharan countries, like uh, once upon a time, you talk about Liberia as being a, a transit point, you know. Uh, for, for terrorist activities, but it was not profound. Uh, so uh, you have the reports on the integrated uh, budget strategies, and that is for the way the United States government um, uh, gave budgetary support to uh, activities internationally. You have the International Affairs Report as well, uh, you know, and you have the, the Foreign Relations Report. So you have the the country reports on human rights practices. This is the one we are talking about. This is the one that the State Department uh, actually published, uh, released on human rights activities in Liberia. And I want to say that if you look at the contents of the report, uh, it is something that we have to take very seriously. I know that this is a routine report. It comes out annually and it's been coming out in past years. And the interesting thing about it, nothing has changed much. 
if even you were to go as far back as 1998, when Taylor won election, the special election in 1997, the human rights reports that came up, it talk about some of the things that we see today. At that time, it talk about extrajudicial killings. You know, it talk about arbitrariness. Uh, it, it talk about rape. It talk about all of the things we are talking about here. Um, uh, torture, uh, beating and, and jailing people, you know, that question the government on its activities. And, and if you came forth during the early time when she took over, at the time we feel that uh, we have actually uh, initiated uh, democratic governance in Liberia after the 20 uh, 2005 elections, you still had a report coming up and some of these issues were being reflected in those reports, human rights violations, rape, they have now gone away. You know, the issue of corruption, political corruption, the issue of uh, people committing economic crimes have always characterized the U.S. State Department report. Now this report is not also different from those reports. Right. The problem, uh, Dennis, is why is it that the content of the report is not changing? Right. It is because successive governments, and including this one, uh, they don't pay attention to the U.S. State Department report, which is a report published by the United States government. And if you look at this report, I talk about all the human rights issues committed during the period. They talk about arbitrariness. They talk about the, 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 the issue of killings, you know, people getting missing. They talk about all of these issues. If we had these issues in the past and we have a government that made a commitment that is going to govern differently so that many of these issues can be resolved, the stock taken by the U.S. government is something that presents an opportunity to this government to be able to take action to address those issues so that the next report does not reflect the same human rights violations that are reflected here. And the report is characterized by facts. Those are factual activities where instances mention of those violations. So I also like to add that uh, there is a terrible precedent set here by the government, the response of the government. I see it as not a response, as a total disrespect to the Liberian people. Because when you respond to the report before even acknowledging the, the, the role of the US State Department to call your attention to things that are happening to your people in your country negatively, instead you are coming to put up a defense right. and to also say that this is entrenched uh, political. Uh, and we'll, and we'll, get, we'll get to that. We'll get to that part, Joe, if you can conclude. Okay, so I just wanted to say, yes, I agree. The report is something very important. I think that the issues in there are damning. Uh, they are things that the government needs to look at seriously, that opposition politicians need to look at, review, and make recommendations uh, in terms of how to deal with those issues. But it is very important that we look at this, this report. In Thank you. Report. And some of the things the report look at, arbitrary deprivation of life and other unlawful or politically motivated killings, prison and detention center conditions, freedom of peaceful assembly and association, freedom of expression, including for the press, uh, elections and political participation, the, uh, the US government will assess that, acts of violence, criminalization and other abuses based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So these are some of the things that they talk about and the marks, there were some places where they say, well, like a political detainees, they will give Liberia, okay, there's no political detainee. So one thing that we cannot deny is uh, this is a fair assessment. They are actually assessing what is happening. So there is no telling that we cannot deny that those things the report mentioned are happening. That's what we all agree on, right? But uh, Mr. So, Kuna, absolutely. Mr. Kuna, you disagree? No, 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 I don't disagree. I mean, right. I think, I so the problem is, the problem now is, uh, as we said, why is this keep happening? And uh, someone reading the report and say, Labra, this, 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 that, and it's all bad. Someone may say, so what? What next? Is the U.S. going to do something about it? Is anybody going to do anything about it? Is anybody paying attention? What is the purpose of this report seven if we are not? If there's nothing being done about it, what's the point, Joker? Um, so let me let me just give a scenario that reflects uh, the rationale of the report. Uh, I will give uh, a house. 
uh, scenario for that matter. Uh, I build a house and I use uh, a 14 gauge zinc to roof my house. And after five years, it's all rusted. And every time it rings, it's leaking. And adjacent to my house is Mr. Wilmot Coney's house. He built his house and he used uh, the 28 gauge zinc. And Coney has gone 15 years. It's not even rusted yet. And my house is leaking. And every time my house is leaking, there's a problem. It's creating crack in the walls because the walls are getting soaked and my children getting sick. And Kuni comes out and say, hey, Joe, I think uh, you need to change your zinc because your zinc is going to leak continuously because it is thin and it doesn't have the quality to withstand the pressure from the sun and the rain uh, to save your family. And exactly that's the kind of stock that the US government takes. And this one is an example of that stock that the US government takes. The problem is that we do not see the report as an opportunity. There are two um, perceptions here to the US uh, State Department report. The first perception from the government is like you are making an accusation and that the government will be in trouble. So the government sees it from that perspective and put herself in a defensive position. Right. Instead of being realistic to read a report, look at the thematic areas mentioned in the report, the extent of the violations mentioned in the report, the measure of those violations in the report, and be able to take, uh, to first accept, because to take action to address it, you have to accept, you have to take responsibility, to take that responsibility, to accept it, and be able to come up with measures that will address those issues. Uh, so that you improve your own governance, improve yeah. the livelihood of the people, that doesn't happen. So it is this negative perception, this posture of being defensive that continues to harm us to keep these things going on, these issues happening in our country. The issue of rapes, the issue of ritualistic killing, the issue of police brutality, the issue of political corruption, the issue of uh, economic crimes. Uh, these things will not go away when they are happening and the government is not even reporting to her own citizens. It's not right. to her own citizens, but put herself on the defensive when an international body comes out with an assessment uh, like the U U.S. State Department report. That's one of the reasons why we are still where we are with these issues. The other reason is that the opposition politicians who are supposed to also see this as an opportunity because they are supposed to be government in waiting who's supposed to read a report and make analysis of the report, make recommendations to the government and hold the government accountable, not just to go and do it for the cameras or, or to do it for the purpose of, of having a political dividend. Uh, this is country and the people who you want to govern. So these kinds of issues must be a window of opportunity where you can do the analysis and you'll be able to recommend to the government and follow up with the government uh, to ensure that the government implement those recommendations of yours. Thank I you. think that that's the missing link. We 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 the opposition doesn't doesn't see it from that perspective. They see it yeah. as a goal, uh, a measure to have a political score, and 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 it forgets about its responsibility as a government in waiting. So the government too puts up a defensive posture and fight hard to defend the position that it gives as a response. Like I said, which is a disrespect to the Liberian people. That, that, Kune, that's the issue. Thank you. Mr. Kuni, what do you make of the government response? Uh, uh, let, let me start from where Josiah in that. Um, yeah. Because he, he pretty much made some of the points that are sometimes uh, that I made earlier that uh, issues that confront all Liberians that supposed to bring us together for us to, to discuss and find solution the way we end up polit politicizing those issues sometimes drive away the, na the national spirit to find solution. As I said one time, we were discussing the issue of, of a clean voter role. I believe having a very clean voter role for Liberian voters to, pa to participate in the election should not be a partisan issue. This should be an issue that all Liberians whether you're in the ruling party or you're in the, the opposition party, this should be an issue that we will all support. But sometimes when we start the discussion with an accusation, 
against one party, then that very crucial national issue end up being politicized. And this is why you see with this report, like uh, Josiah said, this report raises issues that reflect on our nation. You find one side now that see it as a ladder to power. So that's all they look at it. So immediately the government take a defensive position that look, if opposition want to take this report as a ladder to power, then you know the, the survival instinct comes yeah. up. In that if, process, if, if I can stop you a little bit, so which one happened first? The chicken or the egg? Is it because government <laughs> taking defensive role, or it is it matter. because the opposition is using that as a tool? To attack the government. It doesn't matter. Both of them using the report wrongly. It doesn't matter who acts first. But the point we are establishing is that both parties you they take they see the report as a political tool, not as an objective assessment of events that are happening in the country that you claim the attentions of leaders. That's the point we're making. It doesn't matter who started first. And it is this behavior that has continued from time to time. This is why the report largely remains unchanged. Like uh, just uh, indicated, you can go see all the 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 the, the human rights report on Liberia from years back. I'm looking at the uh, the other day. I went over the 2012 report. We're talking about rape. Rape was highlighted in that report. Arbitrary uh, killing, all of the issues, uh, harsh prison condition, bribery in the judiciary, rampant corruption, all of those things highlighted in the same report. At the time, the government now. The government that is empowered now, then in opposition, was celebrating this very report. Was celebrating this very report instead of finding a, a, a way to address the issues that the report raised. It was a jubilation for opposition. Similarly, people in opposition are jubilating on this report. And that is the sadness of the issue. Uh, what we need to be aware of, uh, 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 Dennis, is the fact that, look, no matter how you take this report, uh, the way people think that this report will lead to some uh, international action, maybe by the United States government. Look, the U.S. government, they don't see it that way. I don't think that how they see it. The, the United States government look at Liberia in place, Liberia in the kind of situation that they find the country located. So they will list all of these things, and then the question will be, but that is what happened in the region. This is how people in that region behave. Let me give you one example. The 1985 election, despite the massive fraud that, that took place in that election, the 1985 election with Samuel Doe and, 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 and Jackson F. Doe, do you know the conclusion of the U.S. government? The U.S. government saw the blatant fraud that, that, that went into that election. But what they said was that, look, this is an African election. You know, this fraud to... that we see here is the fraud that is usually in Africa. So they endorse that. They endorse the Doe election. Yeah. And Mr. Kuni, thank you for bringing up that point because I went to my, my daughter was in the eighth grade and I went to the school to look at work and, you know, like she got B and they say it was okay. So I told her, no, it's not okay. <laughs> so yeah. that's, the, that's the assessment. But here's the brother. If so, so, this repeat... Let if they still repeat, repeat you, will, you will conclude. If they still repeat government after government, don't we, can we look at it another way that maybe it's not a government issue? No, it is a government issue. It is, it, 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 it is a government issue. But the question is, what kind of a government, government issue? What kind of governance issue? And this is why we, we continue to say that in all of these discussions, we, we most time, most often time for forget our own governance structure. What kind of governance structure the country has that continue to produce the same product year after year, no matter who is president? We have to ask ourselves that question. No, no matter who you, you make president, no matter who is in control, we get the same kind of services, the same kind of political services. What kind of structure do we have? We have been actually taking stock of our governance structure and see what we can do to change that structure to a different structure that may operate differently. The argument that is being made is that let us continue to change political leadership with the hope that the new leadership will bring us better results. 
And I'm right. submitting, like I've always advocated, there is a need for Liberians to look at their governance structure and see what is wrong with that. We have a very uh, different kind of bakery. This bakery we have, no matter who is the baker, the bread is still coming out damaged. So we have to look at the bakery. What is occurring in this bakery? Th th thank you. Mr. Kuni, we got a lot of issues, so I want you guys to keep your responses short. Okay. We got a lot of issues to uh, to cover here. So, Mr. Joker, you were, let's make your point. And uh, Mr. Kuni, you did not respond about the government response. Just 30 seconds. Oh, no, the government, well, this, this is why I disagree with you, a little bit slightly. Uh, my last information is that the, gov the government is working with ECOWAS to address some of the issues because, I mean, that, that information was made by the ECOWAS the, the, the Senate representative to ECOWAS, who is not even a member of the ruling party, but according to him, the government of Liberia is sitting down with authorities at ECOWAS to see how ECOWAS can do some, uh, uh, address some of the issues, maybe strengthen capacity and other things like that. At least that is an acknowledgement that the government has accepted this report and they are taking some steps to, to, to uh, alleviate some of the concern raised. Right. Talking about, Josiah, before you come in, talking about government response, uh, Attorney Mombedo Nidi Joa, this is what she's saying. She said, the government response is disappointing. Everyone has a role to play. The U.S. State Dep Report cannot be taken over various instruments Liberia has signed onto. For example, UPR, CEDAW, what were recommendations of those committees? Are those recommendations being worked on? And then uh, Martin Wilmer said, if our government will accept, analyze, and take uh, sees of the report in good faith and work on what was outlined in the report, it will have silenced the opposition. But their resistance to accept the report have given the opposition something to run with. Jokai. Uh, I, I'm not going to mince my words on the government's response. The government response is, is, is a disrespect to the Liberian people and to the U.S. State Department. The U.S. State Department, because the U.S. State Department took stock and reported to us on what's happening in the country and the inaction of the government that is causing many of those issues to take place. The, the report is factual, it's, it's non-debatable. The government is supposed to come up with a detailed report covering each component of the report and telling the Liberian people, not necessarily the U.S. State Department, because when there's appreciation it needs to express to the U.S. State Department and show the U.S. government that it will take the necessary action to address the issues highlighted in the report. But the government needs to highlight to the Liberian people what are those concrete actions that it will take to address the issues. Instead, the government is hiding behind what it refers to as a political and entrenched political ecosystem. This is part of our governance ecosystem. So if you were killing people for 100 years and you're still killing people in 2020 and 2021, that is something nice for you to tell your people that it is a traditional practice. If you are addressing the health issues of your people for many years and the US government is telling you just yesterday, 2020, you are still having a poor healthcare system. Are you supposed to say this is entrenched culture? Yeah. And, and, and these are the issues. That's why I say it's a disrespect so, so, so and, so and respond officially to that report, even the, the effort that is being made individual by individual member of the uh, legislature, like, like we're not going to talk about. That does not constitute the government's report. And there's something wrong with the government communication regime. And, and it has to have so, a way. Mr. Mr. Joker, what is the burden we are placing also on the people? Because you see, it's like a parent get a grade sheet, right? You know, you get a grade sheet. So, the parent get a grade sheet of your child and it's all red. You know, and maybe we say the teacher is, what's about the Liberian people? What are they supposed to do with this report? What should be the action? What should they be saying now? 
the first thing the government has the greatest responsibility. I, I get the government. I'm talking about the people now. No, let's get it. I'm laying a premise. The government has a greater responsibility to officially respond to the report and assure the Liberian people what it's going to do to address the issues in the report. Based on the government's response, the citizens will react. And I, 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 trust me, the government, many of the citizens don't take the government's response in good faith. So the reaction of the citizens will not be positive. The citizen, the citizen will have different segments. You have the private sector that will respond to the report. You have, by what they do, you have the political structure, the opposition that will respond to the report. Their responses will be on the basis of what the government is going to put out there as measures should take to address the issues. And here is where I'm coming from, right? And Mr. Kuna, you can respond. I, I was listening to Senator Darius DeLong and they asked him, should the U.S. put sanction on Liberia on a show? And he said they should put sanction on government officials even tonight. Because in other words, what he was saying, we are helpless and the only person who can save us will be the United States. I'm paraphrasing. So if we have this very instrument, if the government can sign on to things, and then U.S. State Department come up with a report that we think is objective. Why not uh, civil organization, citizens? We are in our district. Are we not? Are we just supposed to sit there and wait for the government to endorse it or opposition to do something? Can we sue people if they are not doing what they're supposed to do? Can we vote people out? Can we demonstrate? Can we carry on some uh, actions to tell people that this is not right, Mr. Kuni? Yeah, absolutely. And, and and this is why, again, I, I, I disagree with my brother Josiah. You know, uh, the, the report is damning on all fronts, whether it is the executive, whether it is the judiciary, whether it is the legislature. There is no branch of the Labrador government that, that, that has come up clean in this report, in all other reports, previous reports. The corruption we're talking about is in the judiciary. The, the corruption is in the legislature. The corruption is in the executive. All the branches of our government are affected. The question is, who gave these branches power? And it goes to the question that I always said, look, these reports are not in the vacuum. These reports are a reflection of our institutions. Who gave these institutions power? And this is where the hard political work lies. This is where opposition failed to work. This is where uh, 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 government failed to work. They failed, the citizens failed to work because it is the citizens that gave these institutions power. You're talking about if we've been killing people for 20 years, are we comfortable with that? Maybe the people of Liberia, you know, maybe they are comfortable with that. This is why they keep electing people that are making these decisions. If they are not comfortable, then we'll make different decisions. Then we will make different decisions. But at some point, we have to place the burden of our salvation on ourselves. It is, it is it, again, it's embarrassing that a senator, a certain senator, will be celebrating sanction on government officials as a solution. The senator can, can play a leadership role to address some of these issues we're talking about. We're talking about present condition. What, what sanction will remove the present condition? These are the people that approve budgets for the functioning of government. What have they done for the present condition? We Thank you, about, Mr. Kone. Uh, I'll come in one minute, please. We're talking about pre-trial de uh, uh, detention that is very prevalent in our country. Who you need to sanction to remove pre-trial pre uh, uh, detention? So basically, maybe this system is continuing because that is the system our people endorse. If our people do not endorse this system, then I'm saying we need, we need to do the hard work both to reform our governance structure and also take alternative decision on leadership in the country. Otherwise, this is the fifth that has been falling out as a nation. All right, let's conclude on this. Let's look at the opportunities the report uh, presents. Let's end on that one minute each. Let's look at the opportunities. Well, Mr. Let, me, let, me, let me take my one minute quickly. Yeah. Uh, as we reveal all of the things in this report, of course, let us also not lose sight of the positive things that are in the report. The report talk about our orderly election system. The report talk about no political detainees, no uh, politically motiv motivated disappearances. All of these things are in the report. We need to celebrate that as much as we criticize. 
Then, uh, then the other thing we need to do, I mean, at the at the risk of uh, uh, of saying something that that many people may find a heresy, uh, let's put ourselves in a position to write the, the American government own uh, a human rights report. This is a country where police kill one thousand four hundred citizens every year. Police police death. This is the this is this is a country. Well, it not only rape, but rape along with murder. In America, when you are raped, you almost a dead person. So all of these social society issues, they also yeah. I can imagine myself writing a human rights report for the United States. I'm wondering what I will, how much will it be different from these reports that they also write for other countries. Mr. Kone, Mr. Kone, <laughs> is that where you is that where you will go? Of course. All right. Let, let me hear from let me hear from Joker. What are the opportunities this report rep, uh, presents? And let me just um, say, uh, let me just talk about some of the opportunities uh, by beginning with the um, mentions that Mr. Kuni made about you know some of the positive things in the report. Let us not forget that um, <clears throat> there is a twist here. There is a <clears throat> uh, a change in the whole issue of having political prisoners or not. Uh, you are having professional people disappearing. Uh, could that be a measure by which you put fear in the opposition uh, community for them uh, to, to, to stay at bay? Because people are disappearing, there's no accountability. These are professional people. These are not ordinary citizens that are just dying or disappearing. These are people who are being killed mysteriously. So those are serious issues that, that question uh, the current governance uh, system in our country. Uh, the issue of uh, press freedom, uh, the issue of free speech in our country, free assembly. Uh, we saw how hot water cannons were all splashed on the people across when they decided to demonstrate uh, peacefully. We saw the action of the police and we see the choosing of the government. Uh, say CDC, uh, seditions decide to, 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 to protest. <laughs> they will be protected. They will, they will be protected all through. You wouldn't see instances of government uh, and 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 the protesters falling off. Uh, but if you see um, uh, protests organized by the opposition or different uh, uh, institutions in the society, it's a different thing. It doesn't end peacefully. Uh, we have all of those issues to look at. Media institution. You have Patrick Horner. He's been fighting to register his media institution. Uh, it's been yes now. It's not possible. You have Henry Costa whose institution was vandalized and the equipment taken away. You have all of those issues in the country. Uh, those are issues of concern. Uh, as much as the report was highlighting uh, relative, um, you know, positivity, we also have to look at this to be still issues that are serious in our society. And I agree with you on the issue of political corruption, the issue of economic crimes, corruption in ev at every level of government, deficiency, inefficiency uh, in, in, in functions at various agencies and, and corporations. Uh, so what we have as an opportunity is the report itself. The report itself highlights the issues that we have in our country that we are confronted by. The government has a responsibility to be able to address those issues. And the citizens too have the opportunity to make decisions during election. That's a major, that's a major opportunity during election time to be able to change elected officials who have underperformed or have not performed at all. It's a great, it's a great opportunity for the voters in the country. We also have the opportunity to look at our our election laws, like Kony said, it would have free and fair election where people can exercise their right, uh, um, you know, without fear or favor uh, in a free and fair manner. The integrity of the voter role matters. And that's one thing we agree on. The voter role, they have to do it now. That's one of my frustrations. Why is the uh, opposition sitting down now? Why is CDC sitting and looking at the voter role the state is in? Because that voter role is not credible. That voter roll has a lot of things on it. It has the names of dead people on it. Uh, it has not been clean for years. And we can explain, we can give you instances. But for the purpose of the, the subject uh, that we're discussing, the report, the report presents golden opportunity for the government to be able to review its policies and be able to change some of its policies and be able to change some of its people in, in positions. And the Liberian people need to take serious action during election to vote out people who are responsible for these continuous vices that are affecting our nation and giving us the bad reputation all the time. Thank you. And and since government after government have proved uh, 
maybe unwilling or uh, to do these things again it's incumbent upon the people to get your government to move because sometimes it's not in the best interest of government to do the right thing they enjoy stealing money they enjoy making bad decisions so that they benefit and the rest of the people suffer so if you have that kind of group election after election what do you do citizens have to take charge and do something in yeah when you have bad voter when you have bad voters, you have bad government you have bad yeah. officials because they don't make the, the the best decision for you to have the best among them to lead them so that's it so uh i've always met team and i will say here uh, until we can make liberians to understand their rights as citizens and their roles to hold their government accountable and to be able to exercise that right in a way that will ensure the improvement of their livelihood, we're not going to improve. Let's let's Thank let's you. take us to our that. next let's take us to our next issue, which is uh, a surge in the rape cases. And we we're sorry because for just men to discuss some of these issues is kind of a little unfair. But uh, our female who was going to be here tonight, we had some issues and she was not able to be here but yet and still we are impacted by this nemesis of rape the last time i read in the paper just a week ago there is this teacher who is raping girls as young as six years old gentlemen and uh, there is a sgbv group that is doing very well we have the gender ministry there's a, a roadmap they're supposed to end SGBV, but yet we find ourselves these things are happening continuously. Year after year, we are at the same place. Why does this keep happening? Well, uh, Dennis, let me <clears throat> let me let me kick off the discussion first of all by saying that rape is one of the most abhorrent crime that anybody can commit. I think we all agree to that here. Uh, at the same time. Uh, rape is also one of the challenging issues that face law enforcement everywhere, whether it's in Liberia or anywhere else. And as we indicated earlier, some of these things reflect institutional failures that continue to go from, from time to time. If you read the 2012 uh, uh, Human Rights Report on Liberia, uh, that report documented that uh, there were 369 rape cases that were reported at the time. And of the 369 rape cases, 129 were forwarded to court. And this, uh, this, this, this statistic is, is interesting. 129 cases were forwarded to court of the 369. And guess what? How many cases were prosecuted? Six. Six cases were prosecuted. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five, six. Then the most interesting number is that of the six that were prosecuted, five were found guilty and one was acquitted. So just look at that number. Look at look at the look at the conviction rate and the acquittal rate. That tells us that if we were really successful in apprehending these bad people in our society that are taking advantage of our young children, our young uh, uh, people the, and, and looking at the rate of conviction, which is almost 99 percent, using the six, maybe we will put this this issue under control. We will not solve it completely, but it will be under control. But sadly, uh, for different different reasons, rape cases hard to go foul. Hard to go foul. Sometimes you you find you find the victim families of the victim compromising with the with the perpetrator different different reasons yeah. so it is a challenge and again it's one of the issues what uh, uh, what one of the issues that we should not politicize we saw the first attempt at creating a national awareness by all Liberians to say no to rape it was a very good effort but you know, there were little politics that were creeping in there that tried to distract or distort the message. So these are the kind of uh, national coalitions we have to build. Coalition against rape, coalition yeah. against uh, uh, vigilante political activities. These, these things should not be 
a, 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 a partisan issue. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I all, I'm aware of, of, of a law in Ghana that is strongly supported by both the ruling party and the opposition that outlaw political vigilantism. So basically what I'm trying to say, certain issues need to bring all that women together. Rape mm. is wrong, whether you're in op uh, opposition, no position, op rape is just rape. We need to find these issues that, that bring us together so that we can you know, either create awareness as a nation, find solutions as a, as a nation. But sometimes when we politicize them, it, 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 it undercut the victims of this tragedy. Mm. Let me let me go to Mr. Joka. I mean, this is a, this is very a boring, this a ugly and devilish behavior, Mr. Mr. Joka. I mean, Mr. Kuni lay out. He's in. Uh, he got a law enforcement background, but one key factor he stressed there is uh, the issues like this should bring all of us together. We need people that their whole being should be on those kind of issues. You are the head head of uh, the grassroots uh, uh, movement, grassroots alternative movement. That is kind of issue driven. I like to see. I like to see that that uh, we have organizations that are issue driven and not just the politics of it. Because politics to replace one government by the other one. Everybody, if I'm in opposition, I want to get there, so I'm not going to do anything. So, where do you see your group and also the idea of activism and civic organization kind of putting pressure and? Uh, putting all your resources in this kind of uh, advocate work. Yeah, the grassroots alternative movement, like you said, and thanks for mentioning it, is committed to addressing uh, these uh, terrible vices that continue to uh, undermine our our existence, you know, as a nation and, and bring a terrible reputation to our country. Um, we are committed to doing that. We have our gender officer who is currently engaged uh, with uh, folks at the gender ministry. Uh, in fact, we have a show coming out that she will be appearing along with the gender people to look at the uh, 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 gender policy and look at aspects that talk about rape and the approach to addressing it. Like you said, we are issue driven. So that's why we don't go to the uh, politicians directly. We go to the um, practitioners, uh, talk to them and, and strategize how to address some of these issues. Um, uh, besides that, um, look, Dennis, the issue of rape is one thing that is really disgusting very ridiculous I, I i can't even imagine especially the baby's aspect ripping people under 10 years old people people six seven years old and i agree there is a global concern about this because it's happening across the globe but it is a terrible thing when we're learning about the people the demographic uh, as far as rape is concerned in liberia it's really embarrassing and it's, it's, it's a serious human rights issues. Uh, uh, kids' rights are being violated. Uh, women's rights are being, girls' rights are being uh, seriously violated. I was, li I was listening to, to Wilma when he was talking about the stats in 2012, a little over 300. I would say that uh, uh, women's stat is, is okay. But take into account um, uh, 2015 to 2016, you had 803 rape cases reported, 803 for that period now the foundation for human rights defense reported that more than 1000 rape cases have been reported for the period up to 2020 and then you wonder why are people raping people like that when there are uh decent women around who can give consent and that you can you can make your partners and 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 you can have that integrity and that respect and stay in jaw uh, you know the pleasure of sex and so it leads me to ask some um uh, bizarre questions uh, is there something spiritual about this rape issue that when it overtakes a man or overtakes the perpetrator uh they have no way to self control and they have to exercise it before they can again restore their human uh, uh, feeling or their human nature. Uh, uh, so this rape thing is really disgusting. We need to take action and, and everyone needs to exercise commitment. Look, the government needs to- and, and what action do you advise? We look at the justice action. system, the justice system. We need to look at the justice system so that when they are perpetrators, they are really dealt with in a way that can serve as a deterrent. We're not seeing that happening in our society much. Law enforcement is having issues. Either they are faced with family issues, 
They are faced with traditional issues. Family go to the police station uh, to withdraw cases, rape cases. They do that. They go to the court to withdraw rape cases and say, oh, we settle in a family where we do X, Y, Z. So there are complications here. And so if the, the like, if Liberians are really serious about addressing these issues, advocacy groups should take to the street. And when they are perpetrators, I think they should take some action, serious action, set in actions. Serious actions at strategic places. Look, citizens have to rise up to address this issue. Right. Because Mr. Really, Joker, politics it, always but justice system is not just about the law enforcement aspect of it, it's about the citizens themselves willing to speak the truth to come out and be able to see the perpetrators are brought to justice, they are self-justice. Otherwise, if there is no uh, realistic deterrent to address this issue, rape is going to be a lifelong thing that we have to live with, and it's horrible to do that. Right. It's very horrible. And, 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 and it's very yeah. important because as long as these issues are politicized, if there is a rape case, and my heart go out to the late, uh, there was this girl who went to take a national exam and was injured. What? Not injured? There was, there was the rape and she died. And because, and, I mean, that hurt me so much. Because I too, when I was graduating from high school, along those those that time of the year, that's the fun time for for high school students, and mm -hmm. someone would be killed, and then there was too much politics in it, and government could not do anything about it. I believe, you know, because they saw that maybe opposition figure were kind of pushing it, and so mm -hmm. government just withdrew because addressing that issue maybe looked to them that they were going to give power or wings, or and that was just so disgusting. But that leads me to another point that I wanted to uh, talk about, and this is the uh, the Lapa Revolution. I just want to tie within this because when I saw the Lapa Revolution uh, talking about this, this issue started coming to my mind. Okay, at uh, I think at the end of the by elections, we have uh, now Senator Boto Cannon. There was issue in Bapolo, so there was an election post election issue that ended up to the Supreme Court. There was another. Uh, issue with uh, Madam Edith Gonglo Webb in Nimba County that also ended to the Supreme Court. And at the end of this, there were other uh, election issues. I'm only highlighting those ones that involve women because female participation has always been a challenge. And at the end of this, a group came up because there have been a lot of women advocacy, even uh, Madam Attorney Mombedo Joa, who appeared here before, was, I think, the the attorney for Madame Boto Cannon. And so they have these various women movement that were kind of championing these issues. At the end, we saw, I saw this photo about the Lapa revolution. And I wanted to talk about, you know, also address it. So you see them, they are in the Lapa, they say the Lapa revolution today with Madame Magdala Cooper, celebrating our newly elected female Senator of Bapolo. So you see they are in Lapa. And the goal there is, uh, and there was a, a teleconference or some where Madame Cooper was speaking and talking about the same Lapa revolution. And one thing that came to my mind was uh, why it is a good thing for women to rally around other women that are seeking elected position. But I didn't, I didn't see the Lapa revolution when uh, these girls were being raped. Right, we didn't see Lapa revolution at a time when other issues were happening. So I just saw that as uh, maybe these women with political intention or with political desire trying to, which is not wrong to put them around each other. But when I watched that, I had some feeling about it. I don't know if you guys watched the, uh, the clip too and what you make of the Lapa revolution. Mr. Uh -huh. Huh? Uh, I can go first. first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever, doesn't matter to me. Then is um the first of all, I uh, uh Madam Cooper, I know Madam Cooper very well. She's an outstanding Liberian lady with a lot of accomplishment. And I, I also uh very pleased with her participation in the Liberian political process. Uh, my view about the Lapa Revolution, I do support the participation of Liberian women in 
not only in politics, but in anything that they want to do. But I think there is a danger that, uh, that, that, that is hanging over us if we're not careful how we talk about this Lapa revolution. The central goal of the Lapa re uh, uh, revolution is to call for a 30% uh, representation of females in the legislature. That brings a lot of questions. Why would it the legislature? Why should we make a provision for only women representation in the legislature? You know, there are a lot of questions that are raised, but that kind of goal, that kind of political goal for the Lapa revolution. In my mind, firstly, I think a, a little bit disrespect other women that through merit have ascended to leadership in our country. Uh, uh, Liberia produced the first UN General Assembly president without Lapa Re Re Revolution. You have Gloria Muson Scott that ascended to the Supreme Court Chief Justice without Lapa Revolution. We've had like grown women. Mr. Kuni, let me stop you because if there might not be a Lapa Revolution, but there was still some form of uh, women pushing other women to get there. Yeah, but, but the point is these women went to these positions based on their competency and their merit. They didn't go there only because of women. The Lapa Revolution is saying, set this number of people aside only because they're women. That is the, that is the, the kind of affirmative action approach that I think uh, in the end may be damaging to women, to, to the whole cause of, 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 of women participation. The question would be, okay, we set aside 30% for women. What stop us from setting aside 30% for students? What stop us from setting 30% aside for the elderly? The point, I'm going, the point I'm making is that women participation should be based on their merit, their competence, so that when they, when they, when they achieve their goal, we, will, we can appreciate them more for them to be respected as having earned rather than giving. The way the Lapa Revolution goal is, is, is presented is like, y'all gave us this because we're women. Thank that's, you. The, that's the concept I disagree with. Ellen Johnson Selling bested 22 men in two elections. She didn't get elected because she was a woman. She got elected because, you know, she fought, she battled. And the, 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 the voters formed more competent and qualified to lead. So we should, we should really be careful in setting and making these quotas because just as the women are making their demand, nothing stop other sectors of society. Nothing stop the market people to say, well, we need representation. Yeah, it, also. yeah uh, uh, it, you, you, you sound like the people who say black lives matter and then other people say, oh, all lives matter. Women are no, making no, no, that. No, that's a different yeah, no, here's where I'm coming. Women are saying that because of the way women are being historically treated. Okay, that's why they are coming up with Lapa. But let me hear from Joker. Joker, Lapa, the whole Lapa, you see, or uh, like uh, Tottenham, during Tottenham days, people were wearing, you know, Lapa with the president picture on it. So this whole concept of Lapa <laughs> comes with some history that is not really pleasing to our, especially our rural women like my mother. But what's your take on the Lapa Revolution? Um, um, Dennis, thank you for that reference, but I'm not sure that's um, uh, what uh, Madela Copa and her colleagues were actually referencing uh, in terms of the revolution they launched on April 6th. Uh, I think basically what they were trying to, to tell the Liberian people and the world is that uh, women should also have uh, equal roles, like their male counterparts in the governance system. You know, when you talk gender, you are basically talking roles. You know, so it's not basically about sex, so it's about roles. Um, so that leads me to, to, to backtrack a little bit and look at uh, Rwanda, for example. Uh, when Rwanda experienced the genocide uh, in 1994, and after that, they are rebuilding, pro they are rebuilding process, uh, one of the things they considered was actually a quota system for women to have uh, access to elective positions in their uh, government. So in parliament, they gave a quota to the women 
And through that quota system, women did not just sit as much as they were qualified. I believe in the marriage system too, but that was a special case. As much as they were qualified, they took advantage of the situation. They did not remain uh, uh, on the backstage. Uh, they came straight up from and challenged their male counterparts in elections. They won. Today, you have majority of the members in the Rwandan parliament are females. So Liberia also uh, drawing lessons from that. They decided to adapt a quota system. And I'm sure that even the African Union has a 50% quota system for women. And then you have the 30% quota system for women. In my opinion, they can better make, you know, um, uh, good out of these quota systems if they actually take concrete actions. And this lies within the different institutions. In the political sphere, for example, political parties, women should have leadership role. They should aspire for leadership role. There's a beginning for these things. They should aspire for leadership roles, you know, and not to be just women uh, leader head or women leader in a party or responsible for cooking or preparing food. They should be competing with their male counterparts based on their qualification. And they should also seek opportunities to qualify themselves for these positions and participate because on our constitution, they all have equal right to participate in the election and seek political positions. But on the other hand, if they want to follow the quota system, like I said from the outset, it is an opportunity for them to take advantage of. They can certainly do that. And I remember the guy won the AU quota, I think it has 50%, and then they have the other 30% quota. Uh, whether or not they have pursued it to the latter, that's a different thing. But that's the political aspect of it. Is Madela Copa and her colleagues just looking at political action so that they can have more women in government participating in budget allocation, like she said, you know, uh, participating in government actions, for example, is that what she's looking at? Or are they looking at the Lapa revolution that will go to the base? And begin to look at the education and, of and, young girls. And, that and, Joe, look. and Joe, that was that's my that's my qualm with the, the whole thing because I see this the one or uh, Mr. Cooney will call elite women. I, I saw them, I saw uh, even those that were in the previous government, and I, I won't be surprised that after Madame uh, Piso Sedita, after her term is over, she may join the Lapa Revolution, but now. But you, you strike a very important point that I want to even emphasize on before we move to our next point. That is, you can't start quota system at the top. You have to come from the base, right? Start the quota system in Kidon Garden. How many women in the Kidon Garden that have access to carpet box? How many women, teenage girls have access to women stuff? Because these are some of the things that are preventing them from going to class in the first place. So I believe Mandela Cooper and the rest of the people should start putting lapa around women at that point. Then wait until, you know, after, because if you do not prepare women to get to that point, the quota system will not work. You will just have quota for the sake of having quota. And you have people who may not be qualified to do the jobs that they have quota for. So I believe the lapa revolution should start from the beginning. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was going to conclude uh, with this. The government even instituted uh, a measure by establishing a structure uh, called the gender ministry that look at women and children related issues. Uh, the gender ministry, one of its uh, strategies is to mainstream gender from the level of all government agencies. They need to take stock to what extent they are doing that. How is it filtering down there to young girls who are struggling to become the, 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 the people they want to be? They have yeah. goals. They have aspirations. Exactly. And I think the essence of having this gender uh, 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 ministry is to be able to support that endeavor. And it, it comes from a historical perspective. Yeah, that women have been marginalized to traditional okay. activities in our country for a very long time. Yes. Yeah. So we agree that we should give them a hand to come up a little bit so that they are able to compete in our systems. Whether or not it's political, it's social, it's economic, they should have the opportunity to do so. So I think what Mandela Copa and the Lapa Revolution needs to do is to shift their focus from just the political aspect 
and look down there to see how they can bring out young girls and women who are left behind to hold their hands through opportunities that they will design and work with them so that they can identify their talents and their potentials and show them the corridor, the country to developing those talents and potentials so that it's not the women that can compete with their male counterparts. Because in the Constitution, everyone has the right to compete for political positions. I Thank think we should you. be a meritocracy here. Th Thank also. you. And, and I watch I watch a, a clip from Lena where you have these women that are on drug, drug addicts. And as they are having children, sometimes the other girls say, Oh, the, someone took my child because I couldn't help. I think these are the areas that Lapa Revolution needs to uh, concentrate as well. Mr. Kuni, let's conclude on this one. Yeah, quickly. Uh, I hope we distinguish uh, be, uh, gender gender issues and gender demands and female demands. Because actually the goal of the Lapa Revolution is that uh, they're not advocating for gender participation. They are directly asking for 30% set aside for women. So I just want us to make that clear. That's what they're asking for. And I still, that the Constitution of Liberia gave every Liberian the right to run, whether man or woman. I don't believe in these set asides because precedents, you know, Liberia we use precedents wrongly. Precedents are a very bad thing. If we if we decide to create set aside for women, uh, you don't know what set aside we're going to create tomorrow. Uh, if you, you find the same thing with the, with the creation of counties, we started adding additional counties by breaking territories, smaller territories that were in counties. Right now, there is no limit. Uh, you hear this yearning for the break up of different, different unique political subdivisions in our country. One county now want to be two counties, and sometimes we don't have a, a pretty much good handle on these things. But the more important point is that uh, there are a lot of things that, that, that can be done to to, that, that will promote the participation of women in politics and some of the things you alluded to. The sad thing is that every time we, we try we try to address issue of national concern in Liberia, it always comes within the political realm. Anybody that wants to do something meaningful for Liberia, the first thing they go for is a political party. I think to say the political party is the solution for our problems. You know, I've never seen uh, 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 this uh, national economic a uh, 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 consciousness building, you know, among people. You know, we got our our economy that is in the hands of 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 of, of, of foreigners, and people will say, "Well, we, we can't take the poli without the politics. We can't take the economy." Look, we got to be real here. Every ill that is in Liberia, you find in most countries, but things are thriving. The very Rwanda that we talk about, I don't know how many Liberians know that there is a law in Rwanda they call. Uh, investigative detention where authorities in Rwanda can detain you if they believe that you are a threat. You're not convicted by the court. You can be detained for 30 days. Authorities in Rwanda and your detention come out every 30 day for review before uh, a, 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 a a bureau and all the government need to do is say, yeah, Dennis is still a threat. That detention, the only limit they put on that detention is one year. You can get past one year. So some of these things we put, we have to be very, very careful how we put Ghana. Ghana, Ghana does not encourage rape, but guess what? Ghanaian law, there is no, there is no rape if the person is your spouse. So we we, we got to really get down to solving our own problems based on our own internal conditions. Yeah, and some of these examples may not just apply. I think you can do more for girls, more for women at different, different levels other than frankly uh what i see as you know you, what i see as this power grab by few elite women in the name of gender equality that's that just a power grab Th thank you let's go to something i want us to spend just five minutes not that it's not important but because we are our time is fast spent that's our ritualistic killings and uh, we saw one in maryland and then the uh the people responded by burning houses but one thing uh, this is not new. We've heard about this killing. And sometimes we don't know whether even the accused, whether it's true or not. Maybe we have no way of knowing. But one thing I've seen that is very uh, consistent is anytime we have a ritualistic killer or a, a murderer, that person becomes a state witness as long as he can point out that, oh, this is the big government official who sent me. And so attention is turned from that killer 
to the government official, and then that's the end of story. We've seen that over and over. Mr. Kuni, you've seen that too. And again, these are these are all institutional uh, failures that we talk about. Investigation. I know you don't like, sometimes you don't like me to say it. Law enforcement, leadership, investigation, training, these things happen. We don't have the competent authority to address these issues in a real, thoughtful, carefully investigated manner. But more besides, we have this culture of impunity that is in our country in everything. You know, people feel that they can take law into their hand, even if somebody is accused of ritualistic uh, uh, killing. Is that a justification to buy homes, to buy, to buy uh, uh, other people's property? So this is a kind of infinity. You make accident with a pimping boy in Monrovia, you better run from the scene because they're gonna vend it, they're gonna give you their justice. So they, these are all symptoms, major indications of first the the the, 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 the impunity environment in our country, the, the, the breakdown of law and order at, at, at different different levels of our society. Uh, serious deficit in the institutions of government are supposed to investigate these things and and and, and make findings uh, uh so i mean this, this is what we have our institutions have to improve without improving them uh look let me tell you let me and let me tell you something something that you know you know i'm from the borough I'm from nickel town well what used to be the regular charges the woman somebody get dragged on the woman in the hall get dragged on yeah and sometimes when they put a dragon outside, they say, oh, now they don't put a dragon outside. Then it's believe you me. When we go see that dragon, so now it's some kind of threat. Because if there's a dragon, we expect to see the dragon with all the things. But when the finalists of seeing and putting a dragon outside, it's something like something that wrap around like a threat. They will say, but where's the dragon? They say, no, if you don't get the eye, you can't see the dragon. But that which is there represents the dragon. So some of these things are societal. They are, you know, the, the traditional and we got to do a good job at, at, at moving beyond uh, uh, the level which we, we currently are. Thank you. And let me mention that uh, the lady, the girl who was allegedly murdered, Odell Sherman. And thank you, uh, Henrietta Morgan, for giving that name. Mr. Mr. Jokai, ritualistic killing, the vigilante justice, the people have no faith now that uh, anytime something wrong in their community, there's no police, gov nobody is going to investigate, nobody is going to get at the bottom of it, so they take the law in their own hands. Yeah, so um, if you have a weak justice system or, you know, a law enforcement that does not pay attention to some of these serious issues that continue to affect society, uh, that's the kind of reaction you get from the citizenry. They decide one way or the other to take, you know, the law into their own hands. But look at... Uh, this um ritualistic killing issue uh this this is a a barbaric uh entrenched barbaric um uh long-standing um uh human sacrifice you know for political power in our country and and i'm glad that you just talk about odell issue in in maryland because uh historically maryland is is notorious for for ritualistic killing in our country uh it goes as far back as 1965 to 1977 uh that was the biggest report in the history other things happening across the country uh as a as a kid i grew up in zozo uh lofa county i know when we used to go home and when we used to go to bed and when we were not supposed to be at certain places because even the people who were accused of those ritualistic killings were the authorities of the district you know uh who was who were being accused so certain times you don't pass through the the civil compound the seat of the 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 local leadership of 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 the district you don't even pass there at certain time and sometimes you see they have bodies that are mutilated with missing and everything that's a horrible thing that's something that has haunted our nation for a very long time and it's still happening in my opinion because you are not having the actions that are supposed to be taken by the government to deter these things or citizens themselves are not coming up in a way to hold the government accountable to act so that these things can happen now they are going on a rampage anything that happened to take action against those, those who are perceived as the perpetrators i was talking about maryland the highest number that came out was about 100 between 1965 and 19 77 reported then by a paper that used to be called the Liberian Age. 
and you know not on tennis you hire your superintendent uh called james and anderson uh because of the rampant nature the the prevalence of of ritualistic killing somebody get missing today tomorrow the body is found the eyes are missing another person gets missing today tomorrow the body is found and then the private part is missing that period that was recorded uh that period recorded around 100 plus people who got missing on the top of got fed up and even dismissed the superintendent by then you know so i'm bringing that are to tell you about how entrenched this situation has been and in modern times this time of ours we are still discussing people killing other people on a painful circumstances removing their profit parts even before they kill them that's what we learn you know it's painful it's disgusting it's ridiculous in this time to be talking about that where there is openness in competing for political leadership that people still have to uh revert to killing other people getting their blood you know one time it was indicated that photon yense had vials of blood in his house in 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 in, in maryland and and they were all accused you know 18 others damarels and all were all part of it they were accused nine were charged and guess what the nine persons were set free even the blood that they found in photon yense's house today they were all set free so if you are not taking actions to address a serious situation like this, it is not going to end. So law enforcement has a role to play here. Government has to review that. The citizenry have a role to play. They need to call their government to action to be able to put in a, 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 a system where law enforcement is able to to deal with this situation, no matter the relationship of the perpetrator to people in, in the echelon of the government. The need to address this issue. Those are the things Mr. That I'm Joker, from. before you end, mm -hmm. how sure are we that these things are actually happening, that people are actually killing people for ritualistic purpose? I, I, I don't think we've really been able to establish that. Maybe I'm doubting, but couldn't you give an example of uh, in Nukutan, the dragon? Sometimes people get out and say, well, this person, I come from a background where they accuse witchcraft, they use Sasebu, and they kill people. So how can you really that. establish that this ritualistic thing is even true? So, so this is the point as, as I'm telling you. And if they are not doing it for political power, then the wickedness is something that has to be addressed, if that is it. So if people are apprehended for that, then they need to be investigated in a way that there are pieces of evidence to support their innocence or to support their action that they be apprehended for. And I think that will lead to, you know, unearthing some of the myths, if there's any, some of the myths around this situation. But I think this is a long-standing issue and people have found bodies with missing parts, mutilated bodies in question related to uh, ritualistic killings. You know, these are things that we need to pay attention to. So if it is a myth, if it is a myth. The government has to take action to convince the Liberian people that, hey, these things are not real issue. This is a myth. It's like the dragon thing. I heard about the dragon thing, how people in which they come in the night, you know, in different forms and eat other people's children, you know, at the day. We've, yes, you know, change to different things and eat oh. other people's children. We've heard about that a, a very long time. But this history of ritualistic killing has been very consistent. The dragon thing a little bit could be subsiding, could be different. I remember in 2009, Ellen even had to ban the 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 the, the ordeal uh, measure. That's yes, that's right. yeah, let, let, let's conclude on this quickly, Mr. Kuni. You have one to. one minute, so we can go to our last issue. I've not even brought in my my comments, <laughs> Mr. Kuni. Let's right. conclude, because what I see there when Grady Allison, for instance, they said, "Oh, Grady Allison, they killed Melvin Pine, but somebody did it." But because Grady Allison wants to be president. And so the guy who confessed doing it, he was declared state witness and the uh, charges were against Grady Allison. Mm -hmm. That's the danger of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Why don't we really prosecute the people that are admitting to these murders? Yeah. What Melvin Pine, um, uh, Esther Parker, who was killed at the double bridge. I think Wilma Coney remembers that. Esther Parker killed at the double bridge. All those people, the cases were handled in different ways and you did not get anything out of it. So the point we're trying to make here is that for me, in conclusion, I think that this is something we need to nip in the butt. 
And the way to do it, if there is an instance or an incident of, of ritualistic killing, there must be an openness, an openness as highly as possible, no matter who is involved. That's how other countries deal with issues. Right. They use cases to do research, to follow up on have the reality behind what is happening that looks like a mysterious situation or that, look, that no one understands or a myth that no one understands, to go to the bottom of it. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Mr. Cooney, let's conclude. Yeah, in concluding, uh, uh, Dennis has always indicated, look, law enforcement in that country faces serious challenges in investigation. I know it because I was part of them before. There are certain times the, we lack the resources, we lack the, the time, we lack it to investigate things and bring them to conclusion. So in a society where law enforcement is one thing in this regard, cannot provide answers to serious issues of crime and other activities that affect the people, people, they go to draw their own conclusions. I'm not in a position to reject ritualistic murder, but sometimes we, there has not been a, a, a determinative investigation of some of these murders to really find out you know, what is the cause. So in our typical self, whatever we don't understand, we ascribe it, we, we take something that is easy that we can reach. How many people are not sick in Liberia by the time they talk about their sickness, they talk about somebody giving them the wish. Nobody go to hospital. There is not a doctor finding. We, our society is still primitive to some extent. The primitive aspect of the society continue to follow us. Institutions are not changing. Practices are not changing. So we continue to go in this vicious cycle of these kind of unfortunate incidences from time to time. I want to believe if, we were in, if our institutions are improved, if law enforcement presence, law enforcement uh, 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 leadership in these matters, maybe we'll find answers to that. But if the people can't find answers to that, you see everybody laying down somewhere and nobody can tell you how the person died, hey, whether they were in a night, some kind of a vulture come and took something, some part of that body and they see something missing, they will say that ritualistic murder. Okay. And there is nothing can be done to say, look, this is not ritualistic murder. This is how this person was killed. If you can't do that, the people will go for the least, the, 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 the answer that they can easily find. Again, I'm not okay. missing ritualistic murder. I'm just saying there are certain things that have not changed in our country. And, and, and so we continue to face the same problem over and over. Yeah, that, and that is very sad indeed that after all these years, things have not really changed much. Uh, let's get to our last issue, very last issue, because we are so much out of time. And our last issue here is the election that is going on, the mayor election or campaign that is going on in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. I want to bring this up because it concerns our Liberian community. Here are the uh, candidates, and one of them is our own Winfred Russell, and you also have so uh, let me get their, their, their name straight here. You can only recognize, we have uh, Lisa Jacobson, that's the only lady there. Yelnan Kodumova, Mark Mata, Boyd Morrison, Benjamin Osimena, and uh, Winfred Russell and Hollis Winston. So Holly is the, 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 the other young man besides uh, Winston Russell that we can see at the uh, top right. Well, Winston Ross, Winfield Russell won as a city council member, I think it was a, a year or two ago, two years ago, and now he's going for mayor. And uh, at, but we have Liberians on both sides. There are Liberians that are supporting Mr. Hollis Winston, which is their right to do. But what we see in what is taking place is uh, an extension of the Liberian politics into the U.S. politics. We see that uh, Winston, Winsfield Russell has some strong views on the Liberian government, sometimes as, as you can see from his post. And also he has uh, someone who I think is the leading political figure in Liberia, Henry Costa, who is like a phase of his campaign in the Liberian community. 
And so you see that uh, those that are mainly government, leaning pro-government, they are really canvassing against him and supporting Mr. Holly Winston. And one of those who is leading that too is uh, Mr. Y. Michael Gilman of Gide Hard Talk. So most people, and then I think last night he went uh, with some charges, personal information or things that he thinks or uh, he has unearthed personally about Mr. Winfred Russell. He first sent that in a post and there was a lot of responses to his posting. And he went ahead with his show talking about all different things that he says uh, Mr. Russell has been involved with. What I bring this up is uh, it's in the LeBron community, people are discussing it. I know you've heard about this and you've seen the posting. First of all, let's be clear. It is the right of any librarian to choose who to support in the mayoral race. As regards our librarian community and librarians on one side fighting one another, uh, going down dirty in this campaign is something that I think that is worth some time to discuss. Mr. Jokai, I don't know if you saw that. What's your take? Well, I think basically you you struck the you you struck the point that you know Liberians have their right um, to support any candidate of their choice in an election of that nature. Uh, but I think um, the buck is with uh, Winfrey, uh, who's supposed to structure his uh, campaign strategy in a way that can attract the support of even people uh, who disagree with him. Uh, with his political views, you know, about Liberia. I think that's what he, he, the onus is upon him to be able to do that because this is about Brooklyn Park. I know that there are a lot of Liberians there in Brooklyn Park, but this is not about, you know, uh, decisions that will be made in the country. Uh, it would be in the best interest of the country to have a Liberian to serve, you know, in that position as a mayor of Brooklyn Park. So that's why I say he has a greater, uh, a responsibility to be able to convince supporters of both sides, uh, people who agree with him, uh, his views on Liberia, and people who don't agree with his views on Liberia, depending on how he proceeds with it. And he also needs to caution people who are supporting him so that the language will not actually push others away, that will keep them to support them for this cause. Uh, because this will be in his interest to win, and also it will be a positive reflection for Liberians who are also in Brooklyn Park. Mr. Kuni. Uh Yeah, Dennis, you know, uh, in February of 2016, I had the privilege of visiting the White House as president of the Union of Liberian Association in the Americas. During that visit, an impression was made on me by the White House coordinator that I was in meeting with. The coordinator informed me that there were about 18 million 18 million naturalized citizens in the United States that were not participating in the political process. And the way we could shape some of the, the conditions in, in the various communities in which we resided is to be part of the political process. I say that to say that I have been a long-term supporter of Liberians in the American political process. I've Three, three things I've committed myself to, to do in the United States. To support any Labrun author, no matter what is written in the book. Whether I agree with the book or not, I try to support that author because I recognize the effort that it takes. These, yeah, okay, you always catch me on your book. <laughs> These are things that some of us don't easily do. The other thing, I try to do is to support all Liberians, like I said, that participate in the U.S. political process. I was one of the, I made my modest contribution to Mr. Russell during his, his previous, uh, his current election and the position that he said, and I supported other Liberian candidates. Uh, but, you know, I'm not in his campaign. So maybe the campaign has made a calculation on the route that they're taking to take an openly vocal Liberian political opposition person to play a key role in a campaign. But this is what I do know. The vote of Liberians in the various jurisdiction, those who tap into that vote, they always something like it is their secret weapon that they have 
that the others don't have. So, for example, if you go in Rhode Island, why are Liberia so powerful in Rhode Island? If you go in Rhode Island, the, the, the Democrat and the Republican, they will fight over the vote. The Democrat will take the, the Liberian vote, or even if it is an internal Liberian vote, the one who is aligned to the Liberian community has that Liberian vote in their pocket yeah, as a secret weapon that will crush. You know, even if there was a 50-50 among their own voters, that is the power of the Liberian vote. So to, to illustrate this point, let's go to Brooklyn Park. You find all these good candidates in Brooklyn Park that are running. The Liberian vote should be a secret weapon for Mr. Russell. That's why he should be. And then he should go into the competition with his opponent for all other votes. Now, if a secret weapon is, is divided for whatever uh, campaign decision they make, I see that as a problem. I see it as a problem. So my only urging is that he should do whatever he can do to unite Liberians in Brooklyn Park so that at the end of the day, even if Everybody uh, don't vote for him, but he can maintain that secret weapon because some of the opponents, they, they may not even know the Liberian voting power. He knows it. That is his, that is his home court. And I don't, I, don't, I don't like to see him go to the election with a home court divided. Yeah. You know. You, you, so, you, Dennis, that, Dennis that's, uh, the, that's the point I was trying to make when I said that the uh, campaign language. Yeah. When I said the campaign language, when I said they should look at the structure, the message of their campaign, because the Liberian vote should be a repository for him. It should be something kept. It should be something that Absolutely. he and he wants to struggle over and they should not divide. Absolutely, if he wants to win. And yeah. if he is having issues with it, then he needs to reevaluate his campaign strategy. That's but the only if, way. But if Liberians are going down in the gutter with him, is that something that we should be doing or... Well, again, again, then it, this is this is what I call this is what I call the unnecessary politicization of our activities. I feel that barring any any major flaw, Liberians should celebrate for any Liberian that put their hand up in America. That should be our our national pride. It should be our pride. It should be a pride for us that a son or a daughter of us is putting their hand up in, in, in this politics. But it depends on how you go. Now, if Liberians begin to air their dirty laundry, the, what people say, they say, if the husband sell you, the also will not buy yes, you. Will not buy you. That land. Okay. So, yes. Mr. Kuni, you also talk about home code advantage, right? Right. And I want to use that to illustrate point when we were on the refugee camp in Budumburam. If you if your friends come to you and you invite them to eat, you use the biggest spoon because that's your home code advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to our true. comments, ladies and gentlemen. If you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia and this is Tough Talking Thursday. And we are about to uh, draw down our curtains because we set up one third or one hour, 30 minutes. We've gone past that. But Mr. Cooney, someone is accusing you. I want you to respond to this comment. Mm. Joshua F. Patakoli, focus on Labro. Please dissociate FOL from Mr. Wilmer Cooney's session a few minutes ago about rape reported by women in a marriage. Dan, Mr. Cooney, did they just did you just frown upon women who claim rape because they do not suppose since they are in a marriage or that that is alien to our culture? Let's clarify yourself. What did you say, Mr. Cole? Well, I think the person didn't understand me clearly because I was making a comparison between our rape law and, and rape law in Ghana. Our rape law recognized rape for all women, married or unmarried. Ghanaian rape law recognized rape only if the woman is not your spouse or if the person is, if the partner is not your spouse. That the, it was a comparative something. So I, I, I think I, th I think that person misunderstood me. Right, and and I, and I said that too. So I wrote. I said you may have not heard him right. He came back. He said no. Nope. The implication of what he said is clear. Just do the right thing and ask him to apologize, or you should. So uh, Joshua, I, I think uh, Mr. Kuni clarified that he was making a comparison. And uh, Henrietta Morgan, because the burning in Maryland, because the women in Maryland stood up because of the uh, ritualistic killing. So she's saying, bravo to the women of Maryland. 
I heard people say that too, that uh, the women of Maryland did well by standing up. Joseph Y. Kokro, this is Edward Kokro, he said, when impunity is observed has been primary mani primarily manifested by the top echelon of our society, then the bottom is left with no other alternative but to do what happened in Maryland. The raping of babies and children are for demonic purposes. One leads to power, high fame, and so many other things, not just for sexual satisfaction. That's from Samuel Wilson. Samuel Zebe say, when you are speaking the truth, sedition say you hit judge we are government and it, so this are our comments gentlemen we don't have much time so let's wrap this up and uh, let me mention this too from uh Zibi say we don't have a fair and genuine legal system our leaders are not law abiding so sex crimes and other crimes are per perpetually on the increase gentlemen thank you all for coming let's uh let me get your closing comments and then we can wrap this up Mr. Joker. Okay. okay uh, Dennis, I want to say thanks again for the invite. As always, uh, it was an opportunity for us to scan through uh, these critical national issues. And uh, they are challenges. Uh, that's undebatable. But equally so, I think they present a set of opportunities that the people can take advantage of uh, to change things in our society. We can always keep doing the same thing over and over, going in a visual cycle. The issue about the human rights reports is, is a great opportunity for the Liberian government uh, to be realistic. It has to come back to respond officially to the Liberian people in a respectful manner and realistic manner. <clears throat> And the opposition also has to be able to analyze the report and make concrete recommendations to the government and follow up with those recommendations uh, so that we can be able to change our society and change the reputation that we have to a positive one. The issue of ritualistic killing, the issue of rape, uh, all those cross-cutting issues, those are cross-cutting issues. And I think they are prevalent in our society because of... Uh, uh, the issues that we're having with law enforcement in our country, uh, the challenge nature, and then uh, the application of the law, which uh, is tied to the overall uh, ineffectiveness of the justice system. Uh, it has to be looked at in that respect, but equally so citizens have the right uh, to hold their government accountable, to call their government to action. They are representative, they are senators, because that's what they elected and they have the power. And the opportunity that affords them now to make the change is during election. If they call these people to action and they don't act appropriately, I think they have the opportunity at the ballot box to be able to elect the people with the experience, uh, but importantly, with the commitment to be able to ensure the impartial application of the law in the interest of the people to meet their hopes and aspirations. So uh, the discussion was was very meaningful. I appreciate it. And I always like to appear with Tony. You know, the fight that the two of us are analysts here for FOL. <laughs> we always come to talk about the issues in a way that present opportunities for the Liberian people. I think that's the bottom line. That's the most important thing. Thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you. Mr. Kony. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge my, my younger brother, Josiah, for his brilliance uh, on this program. Uh, Dennis, the, the, the issue, as I indicated from the beginning, the issue in the report are serious. The issues are serious. We, we all would love to see a report better than the one that we keep reading for the past 20 years. The challenge, the challenge for Liberia is how do we change this report? That's why I see it as a challenge. Yeah. What do we do so that the next State Department report will not look like this one? That is the challenge we have as citizens of our country. My only disappointment is that we look at this report as solution. No, this report is not solution. This report is only pointing out things that are happening. Let us recognize that we Liberians are the ones with the power to provide solution to the issues raised in this report and other issues that are confronting us as a country. Let us not pass that responsibility to another country to another group. As I've always said, whether it is good governance, whether it is good infrastructure, whether it's a good justice system that we see in other countries, those systems were not donated to those countries by any person, by anybody. 
the citizens of those countries, they work for what we what they have. And I'm imploring Liberia for us to put in our, our put ourselves in the mindset of working for these things. And let us stop this uh, uh premature jubilation when somebody say, Oh, this is what happening in Liberia, and then we, we're waving it a flag to be happy. No, let's see it as something that will put us to work so that we can change the condition that is in our country. I'm looking for national coalition on issues. I'm looking for national coalition on rape and uh, telling the child in that direction. I'm looking for national coalition on political vigilantism. As I indicated in Guyana, both the, the, the opposition and the ruling party, they are working together to say, look, we want our politics, but we will not tolerate vigilantism from you, even if you are a member of our party. These things should Thank bring you. national consensus. Let us form coalition on improving the lives of vulnerable members of our society, including our female population, the little children that are victims of this horrible crime of rape. Let us remove politics from almost everything in our country. The solution to Liberia problem cannot be the formation of a political party after every two months. It's not going to solve anything. There Thank are other things we can do in our country to improve our country that is not part of politics. We recognize that the political process is there. So we have to do all of these things. And at the top of it, even when we talk politics, let us try to look at the governing structure that, that, we, that, that, that have lauded over us for all these years and keep producing the same result. We shouldn't be fooled that with the current structure in place, we have somebody who will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Focus on Liberia, we continue with more exciting programs. Tomorrow, by the, this time, uh, 6 o'clock, we have the Literary Hour. On uh, Saturday, that's Saturday's, uh, Friday is the Literary Hour. On Saturday, we're going to have a uh, preposition. No, no longer dual citizenship. We'll have uh, Chairman Weti Kony and Chairman Emmanuel Yato on this old dual city this time they are fighting to repeal the uh alien and nationality law so we're going to have the two leaders come here and talk about it on sunday every sunday we have uh, on point on point we have uh mr george tule and mr jerome gayman debating the issues also this sunday we're going to have april 12th 1980 in retrospect we have two people who know a thing or two about april 12th they're going to be here and give us their view also every other sunday we have the general giving us the opposition perspective and don't forget focus on liberia we are starting our decentralization summit this is coming very soon in, the, uh, in may we're going to have decentralization what that means what uh this whole idea of this king kong presidency or this centralized state where does thank it you come? thank you for bringing where, up yeah. where has been where has uh where has uh centralized it where, where has it led us we're going to be discussing that and mr cooney and the, the lipa this is the uh, one of the advocates uh advocates uh, point that they advocate about and that's why it's very important that you know Let's pick something, this whole idea of politics all the time. Pick some one issue that you care about and let's zoom in on it and make sure that we come to this point of decentralization. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough. And I also want to thank our viewers for hanging in here with us. Until then, from all of us here at Focus on Liberia, my name is Dennis Jai saying good night and God bless you. Bye for now. We all are the